No Credits Roll. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode nine of No Credits Rolled. My name is Sam Whalen. I'm your host today and every day. How about that? Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that the fine folks over at Philly Drinkers have partnered with the show to provide you with awesome Philadelphia sports merch for all your favorite teams. Make sure to use the link in the description to uh, shop their collection, and uh, every purchase you make helps out the show. Today's show is going to be a little bit shorter. Uh, I wasn't even going to do an episode this week, but there's just too many games to talk about, folks. So I decided to get on the mic and, and just give my thoughts on a couple of games that I've been playing lately. And that's pretty much what we're going to cover today. It's not There's not going to be a whole lot of news. I did try to include a news story to go with each of these uh, reviews, just to keep some element of the news in there. But it's mostly going to be reviews. It's going to be me yapping for however long I want to go, talking about two games that I've been playing in the last week or so. Also, before we get started, I want to remind everyone to go ahead and leave a like on the show, leave a review, leave five stars wherever you can, wherever you subscribe. Every little bit helps. Every little bit of traction we get helps the show get out there and to get more people listening. That's really what I appreciate. If you've been a listener since the beginning, I really appreciate you too. Anything you do to help support the show, uh, whether it's listening or commenting or subscribing or liking, every little bit helps, and I appreciate each and every one of you. That's enough of me wasting your time. Let's get into the reviews. First game I want to talk about today is X Defiant. Uh, you might have seen it. It's kind of making the rounds. It's the new free-to-play shooter from Ubisoft. Uh, it is a arena-based shooter. And the story I have to go with it is that Ubisoft is working to fix X Defiant's busted hit registration, which I will talk about in a second. But first, just a general overview of the game. Uh, I've been describing this as the Ubisoft cinematic universe, uh, even though it's not movies. Uh, it's you know just kind of like their version of the MCU. So it's a free-to-play first-person shooter developed by Ubisoft San Francisco, which is known for Rocksmith, which was the guitar um, guitar teaching game that I tried to play and was really bad at. And also South Park, the fractured butt hole. Now, for all, like, you know, you don't have to cover your ears. It's two different words. B-U-T-W-H-O-L-E. It's two different words, folks. I don't want to get censored or anything. Uh, so they're known for those games, but now they're coming out with uh, X Defiant. My friends and I are debating if it should be called Cross Defiant or X Defiant. I like X Defiant, so we're going to go with that. This game combines the worlds of The Division, Splinter Cell, Ghost Recon, Watch Dogs 2 specifically, and Far Cry 6 specifically into a first-person shooter. It's kind of funny when you hover over these different factions when you go to pick your characters. They're very clear about what games they're pulling from here. They get a little broad with things like Splinter Cell, but with Far Cry, it's, it's definitely Far Cry 6. And it's definitely Watch Dogs 2, and they really want you to know that. Uh, and again, it is a first-person shooter. So basically what you're doing in this game, right, you're shooting, you're picking your faction. There are, what is that, one, two, three, four, five different factions. You don't have the Watch Dogs faction unlocked currently at the start. I believe you have to earn about 7,000 XP, which is a lot to unlock them. But each faction comes with their own abilities, their own perks, their own benefits, but the guns are shared in between each faction. So, for example, the Rainbow, or not Rainbow, Six, they're not in the game yet, but they will be when the official first season starts. Currently, we're just in the preseason. But, for example, the Division class, uh, you're kind of like these bad guy firefighters, so you deal incendiary damage as your passive ability when you shoot, and you have access to a flame drone that you can send out that blows up and lights everything on fire, or the alternate ability you can choose is sort of a Molotov that you throw at your feet and blow everything up. The uh, Ghost Recon class, they have more health for some reason. Uh, the Far Cry class, they kind of passively heal when they're in a group because they're supposed to be like revolutionaries, and so on and so forth. So you're getting a little bit of that hero shooter aspect. Hero shooter, arena shooter, you know, each one or the other. And you're kind of meshing these abilities, and currently in this preseason there are really only objective-based mode, so there's like a payload mode, and there is a capture-the-point domination sort of mode. Uh, and I've been having a lot of fun with it. My friends and I have been playing it. You know, I'm a sucker for any new free-to-play game that will come out that might be terrible, uh, but I would say X Defiant definitely isn't terrible. It definitely has its flaws in its current phase, but like I said, it is a preseason, and hopefully they're going to work out a lot of these kinks once the full thing releases in Season 1. I definitely think the game has a lot of potential. You know, with that backing of Ubisoft, if they really want to do this, if they really want to commit to this game being their free-to-play shooter, their free-to-play arena shooter that they're going to update and add things like cosmetics to, you know, their live service. We've talked about live service games on this show before. If this is how Ubisoft is going to really try to, you know, compete with things like Call of Duty, then I think it's a, it's a good start. It's definitely a good start, but there are things they need to work on. 
So the gameplay is very fast-paced, right? The time to kill is pretty short. Uh, I mean, there have been matches where I'm spawning and dying instantly <laughs> because of uh, poor spawns, which I'll get to in a second. Uh, the majority of the game modes, like I said, are objective-based. There is no straight TDM or anything like that, but I'm I'm guessing those will probably be added once that first season fully launches. Um, in terms of the guns, the guns are a little iffy, right? The guns feel a little... I would say they feel a little cheap. I'd say they feel okay overall. With some of the ones I've unlocked, definitely feeling better than others. Uh, the LMGs are my favorite weapon so far, but in any kind of first-person shooter, I tend to gravitate towards the LMG. Uh, it's just my preferred weapon in most games. So that's what I started using when I first started playing this game, because I just found I found the assault rifles and the SMGs to... They just don't do enough damage, in my opinion, at least the ones you start with. But the LMGs, I think, are pretty consistently good. They they do enough damage, they pack enough punch, and the more you... Right now I'm using the second one I've unlocked is the RPK, uh, and it's it's pretty great. Um, I know there are people that play on PC that like the SMGs because they can get those headshots. I'm just not that good, so I'm going with the LMG. Now, I'm no shooter expert by any means. I want to make that clear. I always try to give these kind of caveats whenever I talk about games like this. I'm not the expert. I've played a lot of shooters. I mean, you know, one of the first games I played when I first touched a controller was Halo, but I don't know like the pro strats and things like that. I just I just like to play these kind of games. So take what I say with a grain of salt. As far as the maps go, uh, I think it's one of the standouts of the game. I really like the map design. Uh, there's one map in particular that I think is really cool, the Coney Island map. It's like, a, you know, Coney Island, like a big carnival. But there's it's a payload map in that instance. And there's a lot of different phases to it where you're going through like a big haunted house or a big, there's like a pirate section, there's like an Egypt section. It's really neat, and it kind of reminds me of Overwatch, where those maps have so much character and life to them, and there's so many things you can pick out and notice, and I think a lot of these maps uh, do that as well in X-Defiant. And they're also from Ubisoft games. They're taken from various locations from the different games that are represented in the faction, so a lot of them are from The Division, because The Division takes place in New York and Washington, D.C., so they can just take, you know, any section of it and call it a map. Uh, I think visually it looks pretty. It looks pretty great. Uh, graphically, it's pretty great. The it's a very bright game. I don't know the right term for that. Maybe saturation or something. But it, the colors really pop. I think. Uh, and those division maps for me are most recognizable from the little bit I've played of the division. It's a very specific audience to cater to. Uh, but I found it neat. You know, I'm like, oh hey, I this looks like the division, and it's cool to see those things in first person versus in the, in the division. You're usually in third person. Uh, so seeing these kind of similar map designs from that game in this new environment is pretty neat, I think. And, you know, I'm, I'm easy to please when it comes to things like that. So like I've been saying throughout this review, the game is still in its early phases, and there's a lot of issues that will probably be fixed with patches. Like I said at the top of this story, uh, Ubisoft is working on the hit detection in particular. Uh, and yeah, the hit registration is pretty pretty bad. <laughs> uh, you get killed around corners almost constantly, it's definitely my biggest gripe with the game. You, f- you feel like you're in cover. You feel like you're behind a wall or behind some some piece of cover, and you still die. I mean, there have been times where I round the corner, I turn around, and I see the, the bullets that are hitting me just clipping right through the wall, not because of bullet penetration, but literally because of the hit detection and how the, the bullets are coming at me. It's extremely frustrating, I'll be honest. And... Um, it's also when you're shooting an enemy. Uh, there is a quote here from, hang on, a quote from our most reputable sources here on the internet, uh, a user by the name of bloody underscore psycho 666. I'm sure they are the premier journalist when it comes to these things. Uh, but they said, quote, the M16 feels like I'm shooting hopes and dreams at the enemies, which as someone that likes to unlock the M16 in any of these shooters, uh, I am so, I feel so vindicated seeing that quote because just yesterday at the time of recording, I had unlocked the M16, and I was using it with with my pal Joe, who's been on the show. And there were so many instances where I'm pointing directly at the enemy firing, and my bullets are just not hitting them. <laughs> it feels like I'm like I'm shoot like every third burst I fire is just not real. Uh, so to, to to see that gun get specifically called out makes a lot of sense, and definitely would explain uh, my issues. Uh, but aside from just that, there's a redditor who, again, we're going for the best sources here. Uh, primary sources if you've gone to journalism school. Redditor's always a primary source. Uh, His name is Chuck Bank for Bo. uh, Called the hit registration, quote, the worst I've seen in a long time. He says, I'm surviving way longer running and jumping around bullets than I would in any other games, because, that's C-U-Z, 
their shots just won't connect. And then he ends with, lol, LOL. So some tar- some hard-hitting uh, commentary from Chuck there. But it's true. I mean, I- I'm joking, obviously, but it is true. When you when your whole game is a first-person shooter, these are the kind of things you have to nail or people aren't going to want to play it because it's it's the one thing you're doing is shooting. <laughs> so that doesn't feel great. If that doesn't feel responsive or or accurate, it's going to turn a lot of people off. And it's definitely... One of the barriers that my friends and I are dealing with now is dealing with those that kind of technical side of it that, you know, is already kind of impeding our ability to enjoy the game. And that's not to even mention, you know, the people that are extremely sweaty on PC, bunny hopping around corners, sliding, doing insane stuff that you can only do on PC. That combined with the hit detection issues, you know, there are some matches where you're just you're just completely outmatched by both the game itself and and by the people that are just objectively better than you. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And uh, another thing, while I'm complaining, I might as well pile it on. The spawn system is pretty tough, right? The spawns can suck sometimes. I've literally spawned on top of enemy players only to instantly die because they just, they, they're they right behind me with a gun to my head. Uh, and there's nothing you can really do in that situation. And I've really noticed it in uh, the domination modes where the points might flip, so the spawns flip as well if, if people are capturing certain areas. There's also a um, a mode, I guess you could call it King of the Hill. I'm, I'm blanking on what the name would be. But it's where the point essentially moves around the map and you stand on it to get the points and then it you know times out and a new one spawns and you go there. There were matches that I've done where the point spawns where the enemies are spawning and they just keep it and then they just they do that over and over again and you can't even get a chance to get in there and fight for it because the enemies you're you're killing the enemies and they're respawning right where the objective is. Uh so that's that stuff kind of sucks and it makes it hard to to just kind of have fun in the game honestly. Um you know, you do get that dopamine hit which I love in games like this where you know you get a lot of rewards popping up on screen when you're getting these kills, you know, for example like multi kills. There is a healing aspect to the game where you can get rewarded for healing teammates, which I enjoy. And, you know, I think the feedback when you do get a kill is pretty satisfying. Enemies do have uh, health bars and things like that that you can chip away at, which some people don't really like. Uh, I don't really mind it. But I think when you do get those kills, when you do pop off of the multi-kill, I do think it is satisfying. One thing I've pointed out to my friends, there's like no music, I don't think, unless I am missing some sort of setting. There's no music during the match. There's are there are sound effects. There are obviously the the in-game sound effects, and there are sound effects for you know respawning and things like that. But there's no music, and I think it it's really noticeable. It's really noticeable how quiet it can get uh, without some kind of music. And I'm not asking for music the entire time, but maybe some punctuating music if you're maybe halfway through a match or something. My friends and I have been playing a ton of Rainbow Six Siege, and there is music in that game. Right when a when a match is about to end the music will kind of swell and sort of, you know, raise the tension and make it very dramatic. So I think little touches like that would really help too and sort of flesh out the soundscape of the game. Uh, but overall, you know, if you like COD, I would check it out. It's very much like COD. It does feel cheaper than COD. That's the best way I can describe it. It feels a little bit lower budget, a little bit less AAA, uh, and a little bit more cartoony. And I don't mean cartoony as in Overwatch. I mean cartoony in like a COD mobile kind of way, and that sounds bad, but it's not it's not quite that level of like a mobile game. But you know what I mean if you go play it and you compare it to those kind of games. Uh, I would definitely check it out if you do enjoy the COD multiplayer, though, especially if you like Black Ops 3 and 4 because we are working in those arena shooter, hero shooter aspects with the different factions having different abilities and there being a little bit of... Um, synchronization with those abilities if you want to do that. Most people don't. They just want to shoot and turn their brain off. But there is a little bit of potential there for team play. There is a ranked mode. Uh, Joe and I did a match of that and got absolutely dominated. Um, but maybe in that mode, it's a 4v4 currently, and they're doing like a trial run of the ranked mode. But maybe, you know, there's potential there too if you really want to put some time into it. Now, the final thing I want to talk about here with talking about X Defiant is I'm wondering what the staying power of this game will be with my friends and I, because we were a big fan of the finals when it came out. I don't think I ever talked about the finals on this show, but it was another uh, free-to-play shooter, 3v3v3v3, I think. Uh, I'm not just skipping, I'm not just a skipping record there. It was a team-based thing with teams of three. There was some variation depending on the mode you played, but my friends and I were very much into that game for a while, 
And then eventually it just kind of got stale, right? It just We just kind of stopped playing it because there wasn't enough new content. The gameplay loop kind of got stale. Uh, people that were in the... People were just better than us and were just dominate, especially if they're on PC because we are on console. And eventually we just kind of... It just kind of faded away. And I'm wondering if that same thing will happen with X Defiant. It kind of needs that sauce to make it stand out and to make us want to come back to it over and over again. Now, it might be something that I personally stick with, that I play on my own and and level up, you know, my, you know, I got to get the battle pass, got to swipe the card, already did. Uh, you know how it is. Support the Patreon, by the way. Uh, but as in terms of something that my friends and I play together, I'm curious if it will have that staying power, either in this preseason or when that full release happens, if they're going to be bringing the content, bringing the maybe weapons or new maps or new factions that get us back in and say, hey, you know what? Let's let's put Siege on the back burner for today. Let's boot up X Defiant, do a couple rounds, and, you know, kind of have a good time. Only time will tell, folks. And, again, it's interesting seeing this with the backing of Ubisoft, right? That budget, the IPs that Ubisoft have. You know, I, I'm i not saying, like, the division is like, a, is like a cod killer or anything, but it is cool seeing these different IPs utilized in one game. And I think there's a lot of potential there, right? I mean, Ubisoft, you've still got Assassin's Creed. You've still got Rainbow Six, which I believe is coming in that first season. Uh, you know, will we see the Rabbids? Will we see the Rabbids in X Defiant? Boy, I hope so. Uh, but yeah, only time will tell. But anyway, that's my thoughts on X Defiant. Uh, we're going to take a quick little break, and then when we come back, we're going to be talking about my second game today, Starfield. You're listening to No Credits Rolled. <laughs> And we're back on No Credits Roll. We just got done talking about X Defiant. And now I want to cover Starfield. Now, I have talked a lot of smack on this game. And this is sort of my moment to sort of make my peace with that. To apologize to all you Starfield fans out there. Uh, because with this new update that Bethesda released for their sci-fi RPG, Starfield is officially back in my gaming rotation. When I've got some free time to myself, this is one of the games that I am turning to to boot up just to exist in this world. And I've done reviews now on Fallout 76 and Fallout New Vegas, so I've, I'm definitely in that Bethesda mood, that I have that Bethesda itch. And Starfield is really starting to satisfy that in terms of being a modern Bethesda game that I am invested in. And this is all because of the recent update. It dropped in May, probably, what, two weeks ago at the time of recording? Now, the headline I have here is that Starfield's May update causes head-scratching new problems, which, hey... If that doesn't sound like Bethesda, I don't know what is. Uh, we covered, what was it, an episode or two episodes ago when they did that Fallout 4 update, and it, like, completely demolished one of the mods, the biggest mods that were coming out for the game. So, you know, Bethesda is maybe fixing things with a hammer instead of a maybe a finer tool that needs to be done. But, hey, it got me back in. But, yeah, I've talked a lot of trash on this game, and it definitely has its hooks in me now. Uh, the biggest thing, honestly, for me, and you can bash me in the comments if you want for this, but the frame rate update really is helping me get back into this game. I am such a sucker, or a stickler, I should say, for that 60, at least 60 frames. I feel like there's no excuse at this point. Um, everything should be 60 frames, and this update is able to do that. Uh, the game can now run 60 frames. I think you're able to choose 40 if you want to do for, go for visuals, or 60 if you want to do full performance. And it's fairly consistent. I'd say 70, mm, I'd say like 80% of the time it is consistently holding 60 frames a second. That being said, when I booted it up for the first time and went back into one of my side quests and I was like, wow, look how good this looks. Immediately in that side quest, there were massive frame drops. I mean, we're talking down into the 20 frames a second probably, maybe even lower. Uh, so that was disappointing. And you do get those frame drops maybe in large city areas when you're first landing or walking in rather uh if there's a lot of effects and things going on screen if there's a lot of enemies on screen you do still get those frame drops but most of the time it is holding 60 uh which is great and the game looks fantastic uh in when it is running at full speed and, and no issues the game is is really stunning looking in particular i think the character models and dialogue can look amazing uh, there are some characters that look better than others, and sometimes it can border just a little bit on that uncanny valley. But, I mean, 
when it hits, it, it looked great. There was one character in particular, I, I'm blanking on his name. I'm going to talk about him more later, but he's like the old guy in your team. He sort of is the, uh, he's like a billionaire that's sort of funding your project. Uh, he's, you know, the eccentric billionaire character that you've seen in other things, but his facial capture looks great. Like there was a moment where I was talking to him and he wrapped up a piece of dialogue and on the last word he said, his eyebrows like scrunched up in a way that a real human's eyebrows would, you know, that you wouldn't even notice in, you know, the real world because people have all sorts of facial tics, but to see that in the game and to see that reflected in the performance capture was like, it kind of like blew my mind. It looked so realistic that it looked like I was, you know, it looked like a real person. Um, Now, that Uncanny Valley does kind of come in, especially with eyes. I think the eyes look a little weird at times or the tracking for where NPCs are looking when you're talking to them. A little strange there, but I think overall this is a huge improvement, uh, especially coming off of things like New Vegas and and 76. It's, It's tough to even compare because of the difference. And I think if this is the the path that Bethesda goes forward with, we're going to see some crazy stuff with this, this tech or whatever they're using to, to make these facial captures look as good as they do. So my whole reason for uh, getting back into this game. And part of the reason I wanted to even do this podcast was because of one particular side quest I did recently that by the time I finished it, I basically said, okay, look, I am fully back in this game has its hooks in me. I want to keep playing. I'm excited to see where this goes. So I just want to tell the quick story about it. So it was that character I mentioned before, the rich guy, and I'm going to look him up. His name's Walter Stroud, everybody. Walter Stroud. So Walter comes to you and he says, hey, I, I'm, I want to buy this artifact off this, this dealer. But it's on this planet that is known for its shady dealings. It's like any, any shady planet you've seen in Star Wars is essentially what we're dealing with here. So Walter comes to you, he says, I want to buy this artifact, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going to get screwed over somehow. I just essentially want to use you as hard muscle. So, you know, my guy, I'm kind of playing him as like a a cowboy type. I'm sort of trying to be, you know, not necessarily morally gray, definitely leaning more towards morally good, Um, you know, sort of. But, you know, I'm not I'm willing to bend the rules if I need to at times. Right. So Walter says I need some hard muscle. I say, okay, sure, because he's you know, I'm part of. This group, I think they're called the the collective, maybe. Um, they're like your little team. So Walter's part of the team. He's he's bankrolling the whole team. So I say, okay, let's go. So we go to this planet, and he says, when you get there, he says, all right, go case the where we're doing the deal, which is this like big club where they sell this like special drug that you can only get at the club. And if you try to leave with that drug, if you try to leave the planet with that drug, you can get arrested because, but it's legal. In this city, so there's already cool sci-fi stuff going on. So I go to the club, and it, it reminds me a lot of Mass Effect, the clubs in that game. You know, space clubs. You've probably seen them. Lots of bright colors, lots of uh, bass music. Um, but the colors in this club are really striking. It's it's like a lot of pinks and blues and purples, and it's a s- contrast to what's outside because outside it looks like Coruscant from Star Wars, lots of oranges and browns and and still neon advertisements, but definitely a stark contrast. So we get in the club, and I go and I talk to the bartender, and I say, hey, uh, you know, we, we're looking to do this deal here. Is there anything I should know? And he, you're able to do a persuasion check with him where you can sort of get the guards on your side if anything goes wrong. you can. I'm able to go upstairs once I get the guards on my side because I'm able to access the VIP lounge, and I find the security controls, and I'm able to hack the door so that – in the room where we're having the meeting, I can close the door whenever I want, assuming we need to trap the guy in there. So I do both those things. I cover both those bases, and I go back to Walter, and I say, hey, all right, let's do this. So he says, okay, you got to wait, and you got to find the guy with the package because we don't know who he is, but he's going to have this big briefcase. So I sit in the club, and I wait, and I see everybody walking around until I find the NPC with the giant briefcase. Turns out uh, it wasn't. Uh, I was kind of overthinking it. I was sitting watching in the crowd, watching people walk in and out. Turns out the guy was there the whole time, up against the wall with a briefcase, so whatever. My bad. So anyway, I find the guy, and there's like a code phrase you have to say, which they do give you the wrong dialogue. I'm not, I don't know what happens if you click that, but I say the right code phrase, and he's like, all right, let's do this. I go back, I get Walter, we go up in the meeting room, and the guy, before we go up there, Walter says, he's like, hey, look, this guy's probably going to ask for double because he's some you know low-rent guy in this company that doesn't really care. He just wants to get his money and get out. 
Sure enough, the meeting starts and the guy does just that. So the whole time during this meeting, you can close the door or you can pull your gun and just start blasting. But I sort of follow Walter's lead because he tells you, he says, look, let's try to avoid bloodshed if we can. So I'm like, OK, Walter, let's let's give that a shot. And I end up we end up doing the dialogue with the guy. We talk him down. Walter essentially has infinite money. So that's a fun bargaining chip because you can just give him whatever you want. And I end up avoiding bloodshed with this guy. And I get the artifact and Walter pays him and the guy leaves. So you walk outside and all of a sudden you're held at gunpoint by all these guards. And the guards are like, hey, we're from this other company that's competing with Walter's company. And they're like, hey, that's our artifact. And then you're like, okay, well, I guess that's where that guy stole the artifact from. He worked for this competing company, stole it, and is trying to sell it to Walter's company. And because I had the guards on my side from casing the joint before, I was able to sort of have the guards come over and say, hey, this guy's accosting me. Let's, you know can you break this up? And they're like, okay, the guards back down, but they say you're not getting off this planet with that artifact. They end up impounding my ship. So Walter and I are now stuck on the planet. And he says, look, I know who's Walter says, I know who's doing this. It's my, this corporate rival that works for this other company. We got to break into his office to stop, you know, get our ship freed to lift the impounding. So I'm like, all right. So we walk over to the other guy's office. We go to the front desk and I, Fail the persuasion check to try to just let this let me in, right? To go talk to the CEO, which understandable, you know, if you walk into Apple headquarters and ask to talk to Tim Cook or whoever's in charge, they're probably not going to let you in. So then Walter says, "Well, okay, we can find another way in that involves sneaking." Now, as we're sneaking, Walter's wife appears. I forgot to mention this. Walter's wife is the other co-owner of his company. And she gets on the comms and she's like, all right, well, here's how you can sneak in. It it involves crawling up the side of the building through elevator shafts, you know, in ventilation ducts. It becomes like a Mission Impossible corporate espionage spy thing for a second. And I end up getting to the exterior of the building. I end up taking out the guards and getting all the way to this guy's office. And then, you know, you walk in and, of course, the guy's expecting you, right? Of course, the guy's got guards ready waiting for you. And he says, all right. You're going to give me the artifact, and then we're just going to kill you. However, Walter, because he has infinite money, proposes that he just absorbs this guy's company and makes it part of his company and allows this guy to just profit endlessly, essentially. And again, at any point, you can start blasting and killing everyone. But I'm able to talk this guy off the ledge with Walter's help to have that guy join the company. And the guy's like, all right, well, fine, because, you know, money solves all problems, as you know. And he says, okay, one last thing. We actually caught that guy from the beginning that sold you the artifact. And he's currently bleeding out my office because we shot him and took him prisoner. But if you want to wrap this up, I want you to deal with him. You as in the player character, me. So I walk into this guy's office and sure enough, the guy's there bleeding on the table. And Walter's like, look, let's, you know, let's go easy on this guy. He's just a cog in the machine. He didn't, you know, he didn't mean to inflict any harm. And again, you know, I'm deferring to Walter because by this point, Walter's going to won me over. And so I go and talk to the guy and he's like, hey, look, um, please don't kill me, (laughs) essentially. And I say, "Okay, look, we're going to let you go, uh, but you can't speak any of this ever again. And and the kid, the guy says, all right, fine, sure. And, And that's how it ends. And it just the guy ends up going free. We get the artifact that Walter ends up buying that guy's company and we all live happily ever after. And it was just. It was just such a cool quest line of of twists and turns and of different environments and different and you know there's always this thing where if you peel back the layers or you look at behind the curtains you can see that this outcome probably would have happened no matter what right I probably would have ended up in this guy's office no matter what talking to him blah 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 but it was enough of an illusion for me that I really felt it I felt like my choices mattered and I felt like this path that I took fit my how I was playing my character it fit the world it fit the character of Walter, who I'm sort of learning now because he's part of my team. And like I said, the different elements of it, of the corporate espionage to a little bit of combat, to the dialogue, to the choosing in the beginning to case the club and get those extra benefits, it all felt so great. And it all kind of wrapped up in a neat little bow of being able to let this courier guy go at the end and you know show that mercy and to have it all tie back into the beginning of the mission when we we met him in the first place. And it was it was that quest that made me be like, okay, this is like this is really interesting and I'm very much into this. And that was kind of what got my it got its hooks in me and I was like, all right, we're going to we're going to keep doing this. Anyway, 
that was a very long-winded story, but if those kind of quests interest you, or if you like those Bethesda things where you are you take a side quest and it ends up, you know, two hours of, of fun you never thought you'd have, then, you know, Starfield definitely has those, tiny, those kind of quests waiting for you. Uh, but anyway, uh, during the marketing, I think they described the design of the ships and, and things like that as NASA punk, which was kind of cringy at the time, but... I really do notice that, especially in the base ship that you have, because I don't really care about upgrading my ship or changing it, because there is a pretty robust ship design mechanic, but I'm not really touching any of that. Uh, There's a lot of wires and switches and things, lots of analog tech that your ship uses and then exists in the world. I mean, most of the guns that I have currently are still, you know, firearms, regular, you know, they shoot bullets. There are laser guns and stuff, but there's, it's not like super far future where it, you know, sci-fi is bordering on fantasy where, you know, technology is like magic. There are still those real world tangible things that you can connect with that, you know, you're like, okay, I can see how humanity evolved to this point with the, where we are in our world now and where Starfield is taking place. And like, for example, this, this is something that like, it really scratches a, a good itch for me that I don't know if people even care about, but when you go to do a grav warp, which is like light speed in this universe, your guy like, brings out a panel in the ship and like flips a bunch of switches and turns a dial and then the grav warp happens and it's like even that little touch of doing that in first person it really helps with the immersion aspect of the game uh and there's a lot of little touches like that that really help you get immersed in the world and make you feel like you're really you know this spacefaring cowboy or whatever you want to be uh and I, i really enjoy stuff like that I also recently did a mission where I got space powers, which didn't see that coming. Uh, you, I guess it's early in the game, but I never really did the main side quest when I tried to play the game initially. But you go to these temples and you find these artifacts, and each artifact you find gives you this unique space power. And it's kind of like the voice quest in Skyrim, where you're going around and getting different shouts and things like that. And you even activate them the same way by hitting the bumpers. Um, but that's a whole other aspect of the game that I'm like, wow, I did not see this coming, and now I have superpowers. <laughs> Uh, and it ties in, in the main quest, too, uh, because you're discovering these artifacts for your group. And it's like, you know, I just keep finding these little surprises. And I'm like, wow, this, you know, this isn't this isn't as bad as I initially thought. You know, I was so wrapped up when the game came out. I was so wrapped up in its poor performance and, and sort of barren planets and and menus and things like that. And don't get me wrong. Pretty much all that stuff is still there except for the performance, except for the frame drip drops. But the barren planets are still an issue. The menus are still a problem. I was going to get to that in a second, but I wanted to keep raining praise. You know, but I'm able to, I just think there was a lot of, lot of hype for this game, a lot of pressure put on this game. And I think that was part of why I was so critical on it, because at the time it was sort of the make or break game for Xbox, right? Because of where they were at the time. And so there was a ton of pressure put on this, especially for it being a Bethesda game and Xbox exclusive, all that stuff. And I think that was kind of why our expectations got so high. But now coming off of Fallout 76, Fallout New Vegas, and sort of recalibrating my gamer brain to how Bethesda games work, I think Starfield makes a lot more sense to me now. You know, my expectations are a little bit more metered. They're a little bit more baseline going into this game. And it's making me have a lot more fun than I ever did before. Now, there are still negatives um, that I would like to touch on because I don't want to just rain praise with you know without any any downside the gunplay is still rough you know bethesda's never really been great at that it's certainly better than new vegas uh, but it's a little bit closer to fallout 4 in terms of how it feels you do have like a jetpack that you can boost around but it's you know it's not i don't really think the game utilizes that movement system to its full potential you're still just using whatever gun you have the most ammo for shooting people over and over again until they die. Uh, now that being said, now that I've got the space powers, maybe as I work those in to the gameplay, maybe that will disrupt the gunplay a little bit more, like, cause the first one is an anti-gravity field you can create. So maybe I can lift up enemies and take them out that way. And that will spice things up. You know, there's definitely a lot more for me to see in this game because there are a lot more of these powers to unlock, but the gunplay is still a little bit rough. Uh, there's still a ridiculous amount of menus. There are so many quests that I've done where, you go and you hover over the quest objective and you can set a course and you can basically fast travel to wherever you need to go right then and there. But sometimes it's in a system where you need to jump to one system. It's like a connecting flight is what it feels like. You have to jump to one system and then make another jump to refuel to get to where you need to go. So we're talking like four to five menus sometimes just to get to your one objective, 
just to talk to somebody and then have to turn around and go all the way back to where you just were to hand in the quest. It's it's a bit much. I mean, the load times are short, which is nice, but it's like I just feel like there was a there had to have been a better way to streamline this where I don't have to sit in so many menus and I don't have to just repeatedly fast travel until I get to where I need to go. And yeah, a lot of the planets are still planets are still pretty barren. There's kind of no getting around that. That's still an issue. Um, but you know, when you're in these big hub areas where these quests are, you know, intertwining with the world, that that stuff still stands out. I think uh, quite a bit. And other than the frame drops, there really haven't been anything. There hasn't been anything major that is making me want to turn the game off. In fact, that like I, I really have an urge to play this game a lot of the time. Uh, which was surprising for me. But yeah, the game is still far from perfect. Uh, it's nice to find some enjoyment in this game. I, I previously called it the dumpster fire, I believe. I don't know if I did the own content, but definitely uh, to my friends, I definitely called it the dumpster fire. But, you know, Starfield is back. It's in my rotation, and, you know, I'm ha- I'm happy to see it. But yeah, that's my thoughts on Starfield. Uh, let me know if you are getting back into it, if you've given it a shot since the big update, or if you fell off in September when it came out and never really got back into it. Uh, I definitely think it's worth getting back into it and giving it a shot if you did fall off. But that is going to wrap up episode nine of No Credits Rolled. I want to thank you all so much for listening. Uh, remember, you can always email questions or comments to nocreditsrolled at gmail.com. You can call in and leave us a voicemail at 856 209 0713. That's 856 209 0713. And we might just play it on the air. Hey, if you want to call in and complain about Starfield, feel free. Of course, make sure to subscribe to No Credits Rolled on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcast, we will be there for you. Leave a review, leave a like, leave a comment. Anything like that helps get the show uh, into more people's ears. Also, we are on TikTok at No Credits Rolled. We are also on YouTube Shorts at No Credits Rolled. You can follow us there. Uh, I've been trying to get more into TikTok. I really enjoy posting on there and editing videos for that, so I usually I'll do a little quick segment from the full show up on TikTok, and sometimes I'll do additional content there as well. So go follow us at No Credits Rolled on TikTok. Uh, There's also a Patreon you can subscribe to as well. Can't leave that out. Oh, I also want to tease next week's episode. Uh, Next week, I will be reviewing uh, the Paper Mario Thousand Year Door remake that just dropped on Switch. I just got that installed the other day, so I will be talking about that next week for review. So make sure to tune in if you want to hear my thoughts on Paper Mario. And with that, I will see you next time on No Credits Rolled.